Mr. Mikhail Akashanov, Mr. William Bradder, thank you again very, very much for having joined us today for a very important discussion regarding the Magnitsky Act and possible legislation that Europe maybe should or should not take. We'd like to ask a few questions just as a, a brief follow-up. Maybe first of all to you, uh, Prime Minister uh, Akashanov. Russia's cultural heritage and history are famous worldwide. Russia has exported important minds and fields including science and philosophy for generations and made the historic move in 1989 to dissolve the Soviet Union and grant independence to some of its member states. Russian people are well known for their strong character and determination. For each of you, what makes you most proud of Russian culture? And please name five positive things that you would like to inform the world about Russian culture and Russia today. Oh, you'd like me to, 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 to develop just a lecture of uh, on the heritage and uh, what the influence just uh, our history has on the current situation, but I'd like to avoid that. Today we have, unfortunately, we have a uh, wrong development. And in fact, there's all those uh, traditions which you could just correctly mentioned that we exported a lot of minds. And then in fact, just uh, we have a, a number of great philosophers just so that to develop just human beings, just priority, etc. But today we see an opposite direction. Unfortunately, that's why, that's why. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, I continue to insist that Russia is an integral part of uh, big Europe. Russia, despite on uh, its uh, huge territory and uh, continental positioning, is a European-minded country. That's why just we're part of the European society, and that's why those universal values, as we all call them, just as basic for our development. And when we see, we hear today, just in my country, when the government tried to interpret that we have uh, some kind of specific, we have some kind of our special sovereignty, that's kind of interpretation to avoid implementation of basic human rights, what we discussed today. And uh, I think we should not allow and should not take as, 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 as normality such a development. We should continue to press this government morally, uh, psychologically, and with uh, dialogue. But uh, it seems to be that the current government in Russia doesn't want to have a dialogue, but we have our rights by constitution, uh, and we continue to, 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 to do this. Culture in Russia was always a big part. And uh, all, as we call it, intelligentsia, was uh, always, uh, I would say, on a, on a, on a front line. And, and, and now it's continued to be, to have a responsibility to, to I would say, transfer this thinking uh, thinking of freedom, understanding of freedom and priority of human rights to other parts of society. Unfortunately, the current government right now would like to establish a barrier so that the intelligentsia, educated part of the society, or highly educated part of the society, would perform this role, this obligation. And that is the, 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 current, uh, the current blockage. That's why we, right now we don't have just a great development uh, in the culture uh, or in, 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 in art, etc., etc., although just a number of, of uh, young artists um, and, and performers growing up. But uh, unfortunately, we have not quite a normal environment at the moment. Okay. Mr. Bradder, could you maybe mention five positive things or opportunities that you see looking at Russia today? Well, let, me, let me just say that, that um, uh, since, since I, I was expelled from Russia and declared a threat to national security and having my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, murdered and then his murder covered up, people often ask me, um, uh, are you bitter about Russia? And, and the answer is, um, I'm not bitter about Russia. Um, um, I think Russia, however, is an occupied country right now. There's 140 million good people in Russia, and there's about a million occupiers. These are people in the regime who are basically holding everybody else down, stealing from them, and, and, and basically repressing the vast majority of the population. And, and all of my efforts in terms of sanctions and in terms of this campaign is, is against the occupiers, not against the Russians, because I, 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 I love Russia and I love Russians. And um, I lived there for 10 years. And um, I can, coming to your question, what are the great things about the Russians? Um, you'll never have a more real friend than a Russian friend. Russian friendship means something. And, and Sergei Magnitsky was, was, a, was a prime example of somebody who um, who could have sold? He could have. He could have made his own life easier um, by perjuring himself and and uh, giving false witness against me. But chose his morals and his, his his values over his own physical survival. And 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 there's there's no in in, in any culture I've ever been in. I've never seen you know s s such a commitment to to sort of uh, 
uh, friendship as, as there is in Russia. Of course, all these um, great scientists, great artists, great musicians come from Russia. Um, but I believe all that stuff is, is essentially squashed at the moment um, because the, the resources of the country are being so, uh, stolen. Um, and so they can't invest in anything. People are paying for their degrees in universities. People are, um, are um, uh, essentially s taking out the back door from the hermitage um, uh, uh, art. Um, and um, as long as a, a criminal regime runs the country, then all of the good things um, that, that Russia is known for over, over centuries are, are being um, suppressed. I don't think it's a, uh, I don't think it's a per permanent damage. I don't think that you can permanently hold down the Russian soul. But I think that it is, it is, it, it needs to, to change. Well, that's a good lead into my, my next question. Um, since the era of Boris Yeltsin, there have been concerning reports of governmental interference in the media in Russia about the deaths of a number of journalists. The issue in London with suspicions of radioactive death. There have been complaints levied upon Russia, the Russian judicial system and dubious allegations ranging from tax fraud to murder, such as imprisonments of Mikhail Kordovsky, uh, Mr. Magnitsky, and the well-publicized arrest and detention of the feminist band Pussy Riot. There seems to be Russian influence in the case of the former president of Ukraine, Yulia Tymoshenko. The state-owned broadcaster, Russia TV, seems to be fairly anti-West. In addition to this, it seems as if the current government is in close contact with the so-called problematic regimes, and so on and so on. Do you feel like this is consistent with democracy in Russia? Can things be improved? How do you see Russia in the next few years? Will Russia become more involved in the future promotion of high values, human rights, and democracy in Russia, and in the nations around the world? For either one, who would like to go first? Uh, I think it's absolutely uh, obvious, uh, and I think this is intention of uh, uh, democratic opposition in Russia, so that to uh, achieve changes. Changes are inevitable because Russia cannot live in, uh, with such a government, with such a political cause which uh, leads Russia to a disaster. Uh, disaster it means, some people even say, dissolution of, of Russia, because just the uh, system created right now, the model, I, I call it the capitalism for friends and law for, for the others. Couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't survive long, uh, and our our goal is, of course, just to 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 uh, continue to uh, approach to minds of people, so that uh, whether we devote it, whether we can live in this, or we can uh, fight for our for our rights. You mentioned just uh, media and freedom of media. This. Absolute, uh, uh, absolutely uh, right. Uh, I think it's one of the values uh, every uh, democratic democratic society stand on, strongly stand on. But in Russia, unfortunately, today it's not the case. When Boris Yeltsin was a president, you mentioned Boris Yeltsin. At that time, he was under the harsh criticism by media. It's not always fair, or majority of criticisms were unfair. But he never undertook any measures just to press one or another newspaper or television, and uh, uh, that was part of he understood that was part of part of just building up democratic environment in the country. Today we have just everything suppressed, and even uh, there is a self censorship on on in, 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 in every media, uh, and that's why that's why we're uh, having problems. And majority of society continue to be, say, a television, uh, television set um, um, uh, country. Uh, many people continue to believe just if channel number one and channel number two says something that they, they're saying truth. But uh, our support of my party is in the big cities where just internet is uh, as a, uh, part of life, and that's why just um, uh, uh, people understand they have a source of information to compare different different views on one or another event taking place inside Russia or outside. But majority of people don't uh, have such an opportunity. They have not enough money just to have it, or just um, uh, the, the the internet is not available just in the remote areas. Uh, but that is obligation of the government to encourage people's understanding, to encourage people people's access to to, to free uh, information. But today we have uh, vice versa. We have a, a, a different trend, uh, just to for closing and isolating people from getting right information. That's why that's why uh, the, it's more difficult than it seems to be. Uh, but 
in any case, just our hopes is that we can overcome those problems by civilized methods, not by revolution, by civilized methods. And we insist and uh, by control of civil society will press authority to uh, say, uh, to, to arrange a real free elections under the, the control of civil society. That's our um, uh, temporal, I would say, in, uh, tactics, uh, pol political goal to achieve that. Afterwards, just as a result of winning the elections to um, uh, form another political course and build up another government. Mr. Browder, will we see a Russian spring, or where do you see Russia a few years from now? <clears throat> well, I, um, uh, I, you know, everybody always says when you start asking that question, um, you know, if you, you know, when when you had Tunisia, would you see it in Egypt? Every country is different, um, and and um, uh, the one thing I can say is that uh, the 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 way that the Russian um, the, the way that the Russian regime stays in power right now is is through repression, and um, they're better at repression, I think, than the Middle Eastern countries have, have been at repression, um, or, and in the sense that they're more sophisticated. The FSB um, has has great, great tools to basically they've gone around now and taken every single person who is influential um, and f found ways of. of cutting their legs off polit politically. Uh, Alexei Navalny is now on trial for multiple um, trumped up crimes that, that any, uh, any external analysis would, would eliminate. Um, uh, all the people who are, there, there's a bunch of people protesting from Balotnaya Square who are either have fled the country or, or are sitting in prison or on, on trial. And, and, uh, and they're essentially trying to turn the screws on everybody. Um, some people would say um, that um, they could uh, achieve what the Iranians did during the Green Revolution, which is turning the screws so tight that nothing ended up happening. But I think Russia is in a particularly precarious position, in, or actually the Putin regime is in a particularly precarious regime in terms of doing this, which is that it's a one-trick pony. The, the only trick they have is oil prices. They can support this, this type of, uh, of uh, system as long as they can spend money to keep people from getting, get, keeping the wide group of people from getting angry. If um, oil prices were to drop, um, let's say, 60 or $70 a barrel, um, the Russian government wouldn't be able to afford the current social programs that they have. And at that point, it wouldn't just be an ideological protest of the elite in, in all the great, in all the cities of, of Russia, but it, it would then spread out to, to all of the um, regular people all over the place. And when it does that, um, will it turn into a good outcome or a bad outcome? I'm not all that optimistic about a good outcome. I think that nationalism, you know, th th these people have, have sowed the, sown the seeds for hardcore nationalism, and I think it'll take a very big effort to prevent the next regime from being a, uh, a nationalist regime. Good. Now I'd like to ask you a question about Syria for a moment. Uh, for the worried citizens around the world, it looks like the cr this crisis continues due to the incapability of the great global powers to come to an understanding and a solution for the situation. It is apparent that two powerful global alliances are in disagreement, the USA and its allies on the one hand, and Russia and its allies on the other hand. Can you please explain to us the position of Russia on this matter, and how is Russia involved? Why has it vetoed an international intervention in Syria? What are Russia's interests in the conflict? Do you think this is morally justified to stick to the interests of a nation while people of other nations are paying the price? And what do you think can be done in order to bring the crisis to an end? And what should the people of the West do in order to enable a fast solution? It's also been said in the news that Russia is still selling weapons to Syria. Is this justified? Uh. I'm not in the government at the moment, <laughs> but the problem, the problem is that uh, current government uh, sees this situation in the, from the different corner. They, my suspicion is, or my understanding is, they don't see at the situation uh, how to settle the problem of people living there, but mostly more in a more cynical manner, how to get out of of for this um, uh, situation some uh, some kind of gains uh, and that's why just uh, unfortunately Russian government uh, is uh, not in the position to sit down together with other governments governments of European Union United States and sit down and uh, settle this issue but through negotiations and through pressure on uh, the totalitarian regime there so that not to stop all this, uh, all this violence and uh, killing people, and especially, just we know we don't know exactly who, but there was a chemical weapons, a 
expo exploration of the edges on the, on the, on the, on the, on the side. That is absolu absolutely unacceptable. And uh, that's what uh, the whole world should say no for the whole situation. It means um, urgently calling for the conference and going in all details there so that to settle this issue and, uh, and uh, to, to, to take into account interests of all social groups in uh, Syria and, uh, uh, and the other uh, countries who are, who are involved there just closely. I mean, I mean just also some kind of uh, ethnic and other aspects which is important uh, in, in this area and in, in this region. But uh, the negotiations, that's problem, as I today already mentioned, in Northern Caucasus in my country, that's also uh, not in the same nature, but uh, some kind of features appear there. Negotiations and talks, conferences, discussing all issues, whether it's painful or just endless, etc., etc. But that's the only way. When people understand they, 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 they are hurt by others, and um, uh, not only just uh, people just uh, would like to hear what the people say, but they, they, they get their messages, and trying to build up co consensus on that. That is the only way to get out of that. I don't think just the, 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 the harsh decision um, uh, intervention there could resolve, but if massive killing of people takes place, somebody should stop it. That's to, to avoid such a development, the conference urgently uh, is necessary right now. Okay. Syria and Russia, what are your thoughts? Right. Well, let's, let's face it, there's a humanitarian crisis going on. 100,000 people have been killed. This is, this is you know, close to, to a genocide at this point. The West cannot allow this to happen. Um, if Russia is deliberately standing in the way of a um, solution to effectively a genocide, then one has to ignore the position of Russia. One has to arm the rebels and one has to um, see the Assad regime toppled. It's, it's really, it's no longer, it's not a question of, of real politics anymore. This is a question of, of morality. We cannot allow this to happen. Why is Russia doing this? Oil prices, it helps Russia to have instability in the Middle East. Um, if Russia is a non-player in the world, and effectively in this particular situation, they, they have, would have no relevance other than their seat on the Security Council, and, use, if, and to be used in such a, an irresponsible, uh, 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 human life irresponsible manner is just unacceptable. It's just, um, and I would imagine that, um, you know, following this crisis, one should consider whether R Russia deserves to have a seat at the Security Council in the future. This is not, the United Nations can't function if, they have, if they're hamstrung to intervene in, in a humanitarian crisis of such gr gravity um, and by having one country um, stop the whole thing from happening. Well, that's a good point. To conclude, I'd like to ask you a question coming back to the Magnitsky Act. How can the passing of the Magnitsky Act serve as a model for combating similar human rights abuses elsewhere in the world? And how successful can similar measures be in other countries with poor human rights records? Uh, in case of, of Russia, uh, we are in a specific, I would say, situation. We are a member, member of uh, two important organizations. Council of Europe and OEC, and uh, obligations of government of my country written there, as any other participating country. But it appeared to be that the facts of, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, absence of justice and even torture and uh, uh, leading to the, to the deaths of Sergei Magnitsky and other people in my country. Uh, that could not uh, keep us just uh, in a silent position. Uh, that's why, that's why, if authorities not undertaking appropriate measures to investigate all those cases, and we see that's not the case, even those people who are involved, just they, they got promotion or some kind of um, uh, even medals or something like that. It's absolutely unacceptable thing. Just uh, it is not quite understandable for me why just the supreme power in Russia, not dealing with this. I'm sure that uh, the, the leaders of the country are not involved in such uh, case uh, and, uh, and this uh, bribes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, on, on this particular, I mean, just Magnitsky case. But how it happened so? Since that time, after the death of Sergei Magnitsky, nothing has been done in this direction. But we see why seriously. It means the system is built up such a manner that uh, every, I would say, uh, adjustment in this system could lead for, for dissolution of the whole model. 
That's why we just uh, living in, in a very negative and very uh, tough environment because just that will be aggravated, and that we cannot we cannot we cannot uh, accept it as as a, as a normal situation. That's why uh, the Magnitsky Act is very important because that's the the obligatory measure of governments of our partner governments of uh, participating country, countries of these two organizations to perform, to perform and call for the government of my country to implement international obligations. We internally calling just to implement constitution because it's contrary to our constitution. But Russia has international obligations and the government should perform in accordance with. Hmm. Mr. Brother, what would you say? How can the Magnitsky Act serve as a model for maybe other human rights crises around the world? Well, I, I believe the Magnitsky Act is is the iPad of human rights act advocacy. This is the new technology for, for dealing with human rights abuses. In the past, if you um, if you were a victim of a human rights abuse and you had had the um, contacts or the resources to uh, fight for for justice, your your best hope would be to go to a Western government and then eventually convince somebody in the Foreign Affairs Ministry or maybe the minister to condemn the atrocity that, that you were victimized by. Um, and, um, and we tried that in this particular case at the very beginning. And what we discovered was that um, if the people who commit these things, these, these, these atrocities, they don't really care what people say about them. And, then, and from that, we learned that what they do care about is individual consequences. If you create individual consequences for human rights abusers, then all of a sudden they start thinking twice about whether they want to commit the next human rights abuse. And this is not a Russia-specific or a Magnitsky-specific uh, realization. This is just a realization that, that you don't target countries, you don't sanction countries, you sanction individuals. And the moment you sanction individuals, everybody starts to, to wonder whether they should, they should follow through on the instructions from their bosses. And if they think that their bosses can't protect them from those sanctions, then, then the whole system of doing this type of stuff starts to break down. And I, and I genuinely believe that, that this Magnitsky Act has broad global implications, and if it, if, it, if it starts getting implemented, so countries start stop worrying about the diplomatic implications of, of, of sanctioning specific human rights abusers. If it starts to become the norm, then it will it will create a, a very strong, very visible disincentive to people committing human rights abuses around the world. Okay. Thank you. And maybe just to conclude, a question and then also a request. Why haven't we seen more youth uh, participation or activity in Russia, whether it's voices of activism, protests, etc.? Uh, and how might youth around the world and civil society around the world contribute uh, to something like a Magnitsky Act for, for Europe? In that sense. Yeah, in Moscow, for instance, it is absolutely uh, development, just youth. That's um, uh, the major part of those protesters on the streets. Uh, not only, but uh, the most active, because people, uh, they, some of them, or majority of you, didn't live in the Soviet Union, and they don't have this fear inside, those, those old, old genes of uh, KGB fear, etc., etc., and they cannot understand why uh, their rights should be violated. That's why they're more open in uh, fighting for their rights written in the Constitution, and uh, even a few years ago they, they had some rights, and today not. That's why just uh, this absolutely natural for, for, for young people just to fight for, for their future, for their education, for their job, and to respect, for their respect by the government. But today in Russia, unfortunately, the people, that's one of the important uh, aspects, that people don't believe, don't feel that government respect them, that they, even their existence. That is, that is the, the, the beginning of the end of this regime. As I said, changes are inevitable. We, we, we've, we've studied very carefully how the whole um, anti-apartheid regime started and how it finished. And it all started with the um, murder of Steve Biko mm -hmm. um, uh, and then the cover-up of his murder. And then, and then it went to the high levels and then eventually it went to the university campuses, to the youth. And when the university campus, when, when students at university campuses started to protest about in, in investing with companies that were invested in, South, in apartheid South Africa, that's what really got everybody's attention. Um, in, in, in Russia, in, with the Magnitsky case, Magnitsky is the Steve Biko of Russia. It's exactly a comparable situation. And we, we've been successful at the high level. If you, you can read about this story in the New York Times and The Economist and so on and so forth, but you're right, we haven't gotten to the wide population and to the youth, and that's, that's the next step of this whole campaign, is to, is to, um, is to connect in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in an emotional way with, with, with the people, with, with the wide youth, the people with the energy, to say that 
the Magnitsky story and what it represents, because there's 10,000 other Magnitsky stories, uh, just shouldn't be allowed to happen. And once we do that, um, that will be the end of this, um, of this Western support for, for this, the types of atrocities that the Putin regime is committing. All right, well, we have our work cut out for us, but thank you very much for having come today to share with us your perspectives and your insights, and we hope that uh, things will continue in the positive direction uh, on each of the battles. But first of all, thank you again very, very much for both having come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>